Revelation does not mean uh, obfuscation or hidden or secret meaning or end of the world. Revelation means to reveal something. And so this is a revealing, a letter, and it is a prophecy or uh, another word for prophecy is a, like a, a forth telling or a truth telling or bringing, making something known. So it's making something known that is being revealed. Prophecy is not necessarily just about future events, although some prophecy is about future events. Some prophecy is about explaining past events. Some prophecy is about explaining the nature of God or the plan of God for today. And some prophecy is about foretelling something that's going to happen in the future. All prophecy is God speaking truth to us. It's Him uh, an- announcing his character, his plan, uh, announcing who we are or what he's going to do, what he is doing among us. So as we're opening up this letter of revelation, letter of revealing, we're calling it the, the letter of revealing Jesus. That's what this letter is. It's what it's, not what it should be called. It's what people understood it to be when it was originally written. Now, through 2,000 years, but especially the last 150 years, and in particular, the last 40 or 50 years, people are approaching the letter of revealing Jesus very hesitantly, as if it can't be known. Even just so far in the last couple of weeks, I know some people have uh, approached me either after the gathering or uh, online and said, uh, <clears throat> it seems by how we are covering it that it, it should be very easy to understand. And it seems very easy to understand so far, uh, but I'm just waiting for the penny to drop because I have been so enculturated in this fear of approaching the letter of revealing Jesus that I'm still waiting for the freaky stuff to come. I'm still waiting for the, well, here's the real end times uh, prophecy and uh, the, the nuclear bombs and the Apache attack helicopters and all that kind of stuff um, because there's been <clears throat> substandard or even poor teaching on the letter of revealing Jesus to make it something that it's not. And what we want to do is we want to re- read what is intended to be revealed. And so that's how we've approached the last couple of weeks. Uh, we've seen John introduce himself. We've seen Jesus introduce himself. Um, we've seen these letters or the letter to the seven churches, which is two, seven specific churches in what is now Turkey or Asia Minor back in the day, but also for us. We've seen what are, what's the nature of these symbols. Why is the author, who is Jesus, but also John, uh, why write with symbols? Why not just be very clear and say, well, this is what I'm talking about and this is what it means. And as we've seen, uh, we need to read the Bible, the Bible literarily, not just literally, so that we can actually understand when a poet is writing poetry, we understand it poetically. When a um, demographer, someone who's telling, like giving uh, uh, the generations is writing, they're, they're writing to... Um, make understood these generations. When a narrator is writing narrative, we understand this is a story of historical events. And when a revealer is writing revelation, that something is going to be revealed. It's written in a sense with signs and signposts and symbols, um, but not so that we wouldn't understand, so that we would understand. In fact, next week, I think we're going to get to a place, or maybe the week after, we get to a place where an angel tells John, oh, you've, you've seen this vision. Don't write that down. I'm not revealing that yet. Uh, but everything else is here for a revealing, for an unveiling. So today we're in Revelation 4 and 5, and there's going to be some things that you're going to read, we're going to hear, and you're going to think, now this sounds like more of the freaky stuff that uh, you know, I thought we would be listening to in this letter of revealing Jesus. Um, but all of it, like we looked at last week and the week before, much of it, I should say, points back to, especially Ezekiel, Daniel, (coughs) Zechariah, uh, Psalms, and today even um, Isaiah, to remind the the seven churches and to remind us of what has come before, how God has already revealed himself, and to encourage people who are worried, who are being persecuted, who are being distracted in the current day, that Jesus rules and reigns from heaven. That's the message today. So we've got another vision today. We had a vision last week. We've got another vision today and two songs. So today's sermon, if there's a title, it's called One Vision, 
two songs. Let me read from Revelation 4 and then 5, and we'll see what God would have for us today. After this, so this is John writing again, he said, after I saw that vision of the one like a son of man, holding the seven stars in his right hands, walking among the seven lampstands, who dictated a letter to the seven churches. After this, <clears throat> I looked, and there in heaven was an open door. The first voice that I heard speaking said to me, like a trumpet, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So here the vision, new vision or vision continues. There's a door, angel comes, or voice comes and says, uh, come in here, I'm going to show you something more. Immediately I was in the spirit and there was a throne in heaven and someone seated on it. The one seated there had an appearance of jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. So here we have at the center of the vision a throne and someone sitting on a throne. And there's like a rainbow, but it's also an emerald surrounding the throne. What we'll see is uh, the throne is at the center of this vision and other things are kind of laid out in concentric circles around this throne. Around the throne were 24 thrones, so more thrones. And on these thrones sat 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads. Flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder came from the throne. Seven fiery torches were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a sea of glass, similar to crystal, was also before the throne. So again, try to picture this in your mind's eye. The vision that John is having of the throne of heaven. A central throne, someone's on the throne. Uh, an emeraldish rainbow around the throne, 24 more uh, thrones around this throne. There's 24 elders on those thrones and they're all dressed in white. They've got golden crowns and there's seven like, fiery torches before the throne and these are the seven spirits of God or the sevenfold spirit of God. It's an impressive, awe-inspiring uh, vision. But there's more. Four living creatures covered with eyes in front and back or around the throne on each side. So we've got four creatures covered with eyes. The first living creature was like a lion. Second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings. They were covered with eyes around and inside. Day and night, they never stop or never rest, your version might say saying, Holy, 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 Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. So here's where we're starting to get into the kind of, what are these creatures? Covered in eyes. That, this, now we're getting into the kind of more interesting part. They have six wings, but also covered in eyes. One has a face like a lion. One has a face like an ox. One has a uh, oh, sorry, appearance of a lion, appearance of an ox. One has a face like a human man. One like an eagle. And there are these four creatures are around the throne and they are continually, never ceasing in their worshipping of the one who is on the throne. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne and say, so these, they're singing as well, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honour and power because you've created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So if these four beasts, these four creatures, are never ceasing in their worship, and whenever they worship, the 24 elders bow down and cast their crowns, it means that there is a never ceasing worship of the one on the throne, in the throne room of heaven. And the vision continues. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. So you know those old school seals where you might, uh, you know, with a, a ring or with a, a, a seal, uh, tamp down and uh, with some wax, seal the thing to make sure that uh, whoever receives this scroll or letter or, or, or communication can know that it hasn't been tampered with, that it's still in its original condition. It's not just sealed once, it's sealed seven times. Again, remember this, this word, this symbol seven, meaning complete or universal. It is totally sealed. 
I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even look in it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even look into it. Then the one who, then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. Look, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. So again, we've got this whole thing happening in the throne room and then all of a sudden, somebody is standing amongst all of what's going on. And he looks like a slaughtered lamb. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom where you made them kings and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was a countless thousands, plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven on earth, under the earth, on the sea and everything in them say, second song, Blessing and honour and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The four, the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. So this is the, the second vision of John. Uh, there, all of a sudden, is a throne. So he's, been, he's had this vision of lampstands and someone walking on the lampstands and then communicating these, this letter to the seven churches. <clears throat> then all of a sudden, there's a door and a voice like a trumpet says, come into the door, and he goes in there and then he's in the throne room. It's a throne, things around the throne, creatures around the throne, people around the throne. There's four creatures. There's a lot of kind of talk about what are these creatures? What's the story with these creatures? Who are these beasts, maybe even, uh, your version says. It's really a combination of creatures that we find in Old Testament references to the throne room of God. So you look at places like um, Ezekiel 1, Isaiah 2, you meet these same kinds of Im- images, same kinds of creatures. Even Daniel, uh, you have these same kinds of creatures. They're different, slightly different. So for example, in uh, Daniel, I think they have, uh, Ezekiel, they have four wings, not six wings. They're called the cherubim. For us, we think of cherubs as like little fat babies with harps. Or, um, you know, little arrows, little uh, bow and arrow, like ping. That's how we think of cherubs. Uh, cherubs in scripture, like cherubs, they're real cherubs. And this cherubim are awesome creatures. <clears throat> Some of the Old Testament um, descriptions of them is that each of these creatures has all four of the different faces, like an eagle on one side, a Man on one side, lion on one side, ox on the other side. Uh, Whatever it is, whatever they look like, the writer of Revelation, what's being revealed to him is uh, these cherubim are there, are awesome creatures covered in eyes. They see and know everything. They're there in the throne room of God. It's amazing. And this number four we see represented with the four different creatures or the four sides of the creatures. We see represented all different kinds of creation. Now we see in the man, we see humankind. We see with the eagle, the birds that fly in the sky. We see with the lion, uh, the wild, untamed animals. And we see with the oxen, the tamed or domesticated animals. And all, all of creation is represented here. In fact, the, the reason there are four, this, the four also denotes something. We see this in other parts of Scripture, four, that the four winds of the earth covering all of the earth, or the four corners of the earth, meaning all of the earth. And here we have four creatures representing all of creation, worshipping God. 24 elders, we see, 
also representing the entirety of the people of God across time. Twelve tribes of Israel and twelve apostles denoting the church. And so we ha- here we have a representation of all of God's people. It's not necessarily the twelve tribe leaders and the twelve apostles. Uh, like John the Apostle probably is there witnessing this and so he's not in two places at once. But it's to represent. Remember these visions are not necessarily exactly what is happening. Not to be taken literally although there might be some aspects of this that is actually happening, but it's to be taken literarily to help us understand what is being denoted or what is being symbolised by the things that John is seeing. Each of these representatives of the people of God throughout time has a crown, which is both a reward and also a picture of ruling and reigning, like we have this promise to rule around with Jesus. But when the worship of God begins, man, they throw these crowns down. They say, we, we have no crown. All honour, all power belongs to our God. Any symbol of my power is gone in worship of the one who has the ultimate power. And this is where they start to sing. The beasts, so these creatures sing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. And the elders saying, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honour and power because you've created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So what's the song about? This is the first song. Holy, holy, holy. Three times denoting a, like a, a continuation or this is the thing that will go on forever. His holiness, his otherliness, he's set apart. He is majestic. He is perfect. He is righteous. In him is, there is no darkness. And no darkness can stand in his presence because of his light. He is absolutely perfect. Perfectly just. Absolutely holy. He is the threefold holy. The holy, holy, holy. Meaning totally holy. They go on, he is the Lord. He is almighty. Meaning he rules and he reigns. He is purely volitional. He does as he pleases. Whatever he wants, he does. He is the Lord. He is almighty. There is no might that is outside of his might. And these like majestic, awesome creatures, who if we saw, like you see people in Scripture meeting even lesser kinds of creatures or lesser kinds of angels, meeting them and they fall at their feet and even start to worship these creatures who are created because of how awesome they are. And here we have the most awesome of created creatures just worshipping the one who sits on the throne. Let's say he lives forever. He is the one worthy to receive glory, honour, power because everything exists because he made it. They're worshipping God for who he is. He's a creator of everything and sustains everything by his word, by his breath. He is almighty. He is totally perfect, totally volitional. They're worshipping him for who he is. This would be amazing, actually, to witness. Similar to Isaiah's um, vision of the throne room of God. And he was just awestruck. There were seraphim there, another kind of angelic being in Isaiah's uh, vision. And he was like, I... I'm all of a sudden aware of my, my lack. I'm all of a sudden, in light of what I see, the glory of God, I realise how deficient I am, how small I am, how sinful I am. The vision continues, but something is wrong. The one on the throne has a scroll in his hand. It's again why we know this is a, this is a, a revealing, a vision uh, and not to take it literally because although Scripture talks about, especially in the Old Testament, God's righteous or powerful or mighty right hand, we know that God the Father is spirit and doesn't actually have hands. So again, this is denoting the fact that God has a scroll. Seal the seven seals. What's on the scroll? Why a scroll? Well, again, this scroll with writing on two sides, the readers would immediately be thinking about Ezekiel. Two, where there is a scroll with two sides. Or, or even, again, Daniel or Isaiah as well, where there are scrolls, and on the scrolls are 
the judgment of God. Or like Ezekiel says, um, lamentation, mourning and woe to God's enemies. Seal with seven seals. No one could open it. No one could even look inside of it. But John and his readers would know this is the judgment of God coming upon his enemies. And to a church that's being brutalized and murdered because of their faith, knowing that there's, a, there's someone coming bringing justice gives you great hope for the future. You want that scroll to be opened. Even though what you know uh, is on the scroll is judgment and woe and lamentation to the people who will be the subjects, or the objects, I should say, of that wrath from God, uh, that will also bring relief to those who are being unjustly crushed uh, by the enemies of God. Seven seals as well <clears throat> to, the, to the readers in its day, not just harking back to oh, the Old Testament, um, these, these prophecies about the judgment of God, but also having multiple seals on a scroll could have denoted uh, a, like a last will and testament. Someone's inheritance is behind those seals so that only the executor would be the one to be able to open those seals. That's why multiple seals. Uh, you need the executor there. You need the, the, the people expecting the inheritance to come. So not only was it a sign of the relief of God being the judgment on God's enemies and the relief for God's people, but also the inheritance to come. But there's a problem. No one can open it. Only the executor can open the will and dispense the inheritance. And only someone worthy can come and open the seals so that the judgment of God can come upon his enemies. And they're looking around. Nobody is worthy. John is eagerly awaiting the opening of the scroll. He, see the, he sees the scrolls and he's like, oh, our hope is here. I can't wait. He says, I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even look at it, look into it. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look into it. So nobody's found worthy to open this scroll. We're in heaven, mind you. And the one on the throne has this scroll. Obviously, he is worthy. It's his scroll. But around even none of these majestic creatures can open it. They weren't worthy. None of the seraphim, none of them, we're about to see multitude, thousands upon thousands of angels couldn't open it. None of the elders, his 24 elders, could open it. Nobody could open it. No one in the earth, no one on the earth, uh, no one under the earth, meaning nobody who's ever lived was worthy. Nobody. Totally sealed. And we're not supposed to rush to the next part because we're supposed to sit in the despair of, well, we see the hope, we see our relief, we see our inheritance from the one who's on the throne, but nobody's worthy. We can't reach up to God with our own in our own right, with our own strength, thinking we can work our way up to him. Can't manufacture or muster up enough holiness for the holiness of God. And we can't bring ultimate justice in our own strength where we've been wronged. Or uh, For us in Australia in 2022, it's not, we're not living in the same kinds of conditions as the people who would have originally read this. Where under Emperor Nero, like I mentioned in the first week, they were being, again, dipped in oil and used as candles, these Christians. Been, been thrown to lions for fun or just hunted down and, and killed. For John to be living in those times under that kind of emperor and to, hear, and to see, well, he's a, he's a greater king who has a greater justice, but it's not coming yet. Like, come on, Lord. Isn't there someone who can do this? Unless someone does something, there is no hope. 
But one of the elders comes and tells John about the lion. So this is the lion of Judah. Again, reminding all of the readers and John that this is the, someone who is going to come, who is promised, even from the Old Testament, said of Judah that this, the scepter, like the rule and reign of Judah will never cease. Promised from hundreds of years earlier. He is the lion. He has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. But when John looks, so he's told by an elder, look at the lion. And when he looks at the lion, he doesn't see a lion, he sees a lamb who's been killed. So again, we don't think there's a literal lamb there among the throne and among the elders and among uh, the cherubim. But it denotes the fact that he is this person who has been spoken of. It's both the lion, the ruler, the, the majestic one, and the lamb who was slain. At the same time, the lion and the lamb. The lion is the lamb. It's a picture of power and glory and sacrifice all at the same time. God's economy is different to ours. His kingdom is different to the kingdom of the world. Uh, it's not be humble so that at some day God will then give you give you power later on and you graduate from humility and all of a sudden you don't have to be humble anymore because you've graduated from being humble. That's not how it works. Jesus even said in his own time on earth, the most humble, the greatest servant is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Not that you serve and become the greatest servant and then you get advanced in the kingdom and you don't have to serve anymore. Now God, Jesus is saying, well, see how I, the Holy One of heaven, the one who breathes and everything that exists comes into existence in obedience to my voice. See how I serve. See how I show myself. He is the ultimate humble one. He's the ult- he is the most powerful. He's the ultimately powerful, like as in he, he, he is power, but he's also humble. He's also the greatest servant at the same time the greatest servant and the greatest. He is the lion and the lamb. None have served more and more greatly than our king, the lion lamb. And as a lion lamb takes the scroll from the throne, just imagining the anticipation, John has he's wept. He's like, oh my goodness, I, I, can't our troubles cease? Where is our hope going to come from? And then the elder says, look, here's the lion. He looks and there's the lamb. And the lamb is already among the throne and he takes the scroll because he's worthy to open it. And then something changes in heaven. In fact, every, everything changes. They start to sing a different song. The lamb's been slain. The seals are broken. The beasts and the elders, I mean, the elders have already thrown down their crowns. Now all of a sudden, these elders have harps. It's not the cherubim that have harps. It's the elders who have harps, instruments of worship, and they have bowls of incense, like sweet-smelling incense. And Scripture says that this incense is the prayers of the saints, like your and my prayers, that are instruments of worship, objects of wor- not objects, instruments of worship in the throne room of heaven. And they sing a new song. The old song hasn't ceased. The song, a song uh, proclaiming who God is. But now there's another song that's sung about what he has done. That's who he is and what he's done. Uh, the beast and the elders together sing. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom or your, your translation might say, you made them kings and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. And then everybody else joins him. So, he, so we have these uh, elders and these creatures that are singing. They have been singing forever. And then thousands, plus thousands of thousands of angels start to sing as well. And then they sing, worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. It would have been an incredibly odd thing for the people who weren't Christians in this time of, of reading 
to hear that they're worshipping someone who looks so weak. Worshipping someone who displayed power through their own death. It doesn't make sense. The way that Caesar displays his power is to subjugate the people under his rule and authority and where they have other rulers or claim other thrones other than his throne, again, he dips them in oil and uses them as candles. That's the worldly power. And what is the power pointed to in the throne room of heaven? Uh, it's a slaughtered one. What are they singing? They're singing about him dying. Like, yay, you died. It's totally inverted. So we have the four like amazing creatures singing, the 24 elders singing, now thousands and thousands of angels singing, and next, all of creation joins in as well. So then he goes on, I heard every creature in heaven on earth, under the earth, on the sea, everything in them say. So now, again, you have these concentric circles of worship as more and more of all of creation joins in the praise of the lion lamb. And they sing blessing and honour, glory and power, to the one who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. So it's enough to worship him because of who he is. We see these cherubim worshipping him for as long as they've been around and for forever. They never cease, never rest, only worshipping the one on the throne because of who he is. But then we also worship him because of what he's done. Blessing and honour, glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. So why is this vision in Scripture? Why, if it's not a literal picture of what's happening in heaven, uh, it's it's a symbol or a sign of what is happening in heaven, uh, why? Why have it in here? What does this vision of the heavenly throne do for us or do for the church in the first century under either intense persecution and and trying to be destroyed on the one hand or doing really well financially and materially and being very distracted on the other hand. Why is it in here? How is it helpful for them? How is it helpful for us? Well, the vision of the heavenly throne is to remind the church to take our eyes off of earthly thrones and remember who is on the throne. That's why this is here. So try to help John, help the churches in first century and help us to see the throne, the thrones that are in our world, the throne that's in their world. Again, I just mentioned uh, Caesar's throne was the biggest throne. And Caesar was not a fan of the Christians. To help John and a church in difficult times to see actually there's a there's a higher throne, there's a greater throne. And we see this throne, all of a sudden our respect for lesser thrones necessarily diminishes. Our fear of lesser thrones necessarily diminishes. The allure of lesser thrones diminishes because of the overwhelming majesty of the one on the greater throne. So the impressive thrones to grab our attention, leading to distraction. This is in here to help us realise they are not worthy thrones of our worship. The impressive thrones. The looming thrones that make us fearful or discouraged. Uh, they, there is a greater throne to help us in our discouragement. In fact, if you read through Psalm 2, uh, it shows that God, who's on that throne, he laughs at the lesser thrones. When they, when they rage at him and they go, they shake their fist at God on the ultimate throne as if they're, try, as if they're gonna like mobilize the, the authority and the greatness of their lesser thrones against God. And God's like, good on you. And the seductive throne that wants to grab your affection, the deceptive throne, uh, the seven churches who are written to are distracted, discouraged, and deceived. And Jesus is saying, don't be distracted, discouraged, and deceived. Look at the greater throne. See what's happening there. Who rules and reigns? It's the lion lamb. It's the lion, so he is 
powerful. And it's the lamb who is merciful. If it's just powerful and not merciful and he comes to crush his enemies, we are doomed. We're done for. If he's just merciful, but he's not powerful, then he can be very loving and we, we, that's very nice, but has no power or authority to overcome the lesser thrones. But because he is the lion lamb, because he has all authority, because he is merciful to us, uh, he can both will and accomplish his will. He saves us, redeems us, invites us into his family. Remember the churches uh, that this letter was originally written to? Jesus is helping the afflicted to zoom out and remember who's in charge. He's helping the distracted to have a picture of the glory of God to remember what's important and to the, to the discouraged to remember where the hope comes from. There is one worthy to open the scroll, to remove the seals. Uh, one of the big news stories of this week uh, was, at least in Australia, at least in some components of Australia, uh, was about <clears throat> this uh, one-day CEO of Essendon who was also the chairman of a church who we're actually very tightly partnered with in Melbourne, uh, Cedar Hill. And uh, basically, I, I found it amazing that as more and more of the reports came out about what is the controversy with the CEO uh, being a, uh, a CEO over here and a, and a chairman over here, like essentially um, overseeing two different organisations, was the ultimatum, the board came to him, ultimatum from Essen, and the board came to him and said, you have to choose which throne. They didn't use the word throne. They, they, they did use the word ultimatum and choose. You have to choose. Is it going to be footy or is it going to be your church? Is it going to be this throne or is it going to be that throne? Now, I don't think... I don't think footy and church are mutually exclusive. Don't hear me saying that. But the way that these guys are saying it is, th this is the ultimatum. Uh, actually, you have a choice, but you must choose. You can't actually do both of these things. We won't let you. You've got to choose. And then when he chose his faith, when he chose the church, I was reading one of the things. A, a very famous footballer said, I was surprised that he chose his church over footy. I was surprised. Because this person was under the rule and reign of that throne. He had no vision of the greater throne. So this footy player's like, I can't believe he chose that throne. Oh, no, he didn't say. He said, I was surprised that he chose that throne over this throne. But that's because, or one of the reasons at least, uh, people were shocked. One of the reasons was Andrew, the CEO, one day CEO, had a picture from John of the majesty of the lion lamb. It's a greater throne. And we need, we need the picture of the throne. The one who's on the throne, the, one, the ones who are before the throne, uh, what are they doing? We need that to help us overcome or say no to all of the other thrones that are vying for your worship. That's why this is in here. You will face thrones of many kinds, remember this throne. The throne above all thrones, where the king over all kings is seated. Over the coming weeks, we're going to see what is on the scroll. Or, or, as the seals are taken off, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and ultimately, it's not just this picture which is encouraging. It's also a warning to the enemies of God but there's still hope and a promise even for the enemies to be reconciled again because he's the lion land. We'll get to that next week. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to, kindness to us in Jesus. You are seated on the throne over all thrones. And right now we know that there are angelic hosts worshipping you rightly because you're due that worship. But we also acknowledge that uh, we have not worshipped you with our thinking, with our words, with our lives, as we ought. As we repent, please help us to maintain the vision of the throne room and the one seated on the throne and the Lamb. 
so that we wouldn't get distracted by lesser thrones, lesser affections. We wouldn't become fearful uh, when they start to rage against you or against us. And we wouldn't get distracted. But Father, help us to, um, to worship you as you are due. Thank you that the one we worship is the lion lamb, powerful and merciful. And you've, you've shown us your mercy by saving us, making us a kingdom and kings, a priesthood ruling and reigning with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, uh, for saving us, coming for us. Uh, we know we don't deserve it, and so we, uh, we are humbled. Uh, help us to be and maintain our humility. Father, we don't want to um, view people as enemies, um, but we want to view people as people in desperate need of a saviour. And so help us as we go about our, our lives, um, where we have people with differing thrones, um, not to attack those people, uh, but to certainly show them a picture of a greater throne and the love and the power of the one sitting on that throne. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.